that I hope you'll help me think about. So I thought in a talk on excellence in teaching, I might start um, with some images that capture my own experiences with excellence in teaching. So take a minute and look at this and, and uh, think about what the relationship between the photos and the names might be because as you probably figured out, they don't really go together. Anybody have an idea of what? Yes. The teachers and the names are who they taught about or who they in that class? Absolutely. So, they're their names. Anne Wallach was my high school English teacher. She was the person who inspired me to become a teacher. So I TA'd for her, and it was in that year of American literature that I decided I wanted to be an English teacher. And she introduced me to my passion for Walt Whitman. We went to Golden Gate Park in San Francisco and Stern Grove and would read uh, Walt Whitman under the trees. Um, Jack Pereira was my high school orchestra conductor who uh, took the high school orchestra to Japan and had us play The Firebird by Igor Stravinsky, which really high school orchestras had no place playing, but he believed that we were going to do it. Um, Richard Sewell was my uh, professor at Yale, who taught a course on Emily Dickinson. I already loved Emily Dickinson, thanks to Ann Wallach. Um, but it was an opportunity to, to spend a whole quarter with somebody who literally wrote the book on Emily Dickinson. Um, and when the, we took every course he offered, and at the end, we could think of no better present for him than a tree which we carried into Yale's Sterling Library. If you've seen <laughs> Yale's Sterling Library, you realize that it was not easy to get a tree and, and hide it in the office. And then somebody you probably recognize, Lee <laughs> Shulman, who took a high school English teacher and somehow turned her into an educational researcher. So when we think about excellence in teaching, we all have images of the people who instilled in us the passions, interests, the paths that we ended up following. So I want you to just take a minute to think about two or three teachers who most influenced you in your life. Who are those teachers? Who are your equivalents to my photo gallery? And then write down two or three qualities that they might have in common. Take a few minutes. you're done because you're conveniently seated in groups, talk to the people at your at table about the individuals, but even more importantly, the qualities of those individuals. Yeah. 
Similarly, the folks I was thinking of had a passion for content, although I'd say content very broadly conceived. I think you know, early childhood educators, and the content was the children, but there was some passion there. Empathy that we'll come back to, the ability to follow someone else's 
thinking. It's not just to feel with somebody else, which is the meaning of empathy, but to think with somebody else and to follow them. So, you know, one of the questions that I ponder is if these qualities are critical, important for excellence in teaching, how do we either select for those, and then that raises the question of how we would assess these qualities, and then how do we, again, encourage those? Because there's lots of ways of di discouraging these kinds of attributes in the construction of the job. I want to now turn to what I'm going to mostly talk about, which is the teaching, the practice of teaching, the work of teaching, rather than just the teacher. And think a little bit about, again, what are some of those qualities of excellent teaching? What are the things that we think are essential for high quality? teaching. And some of you already mentioned this. Deep knowledge and passion for the subject matter, but also knowledge of students and the intersection of those two things. So this issue of um, what math teachers might know that mathematicians might not is a question that occupied much of my early career, sometimes called pedagogical content knowledge, other times called mathematical knowledge of teaching. Um, and some of that involves the ability to assess predictable errors. So we're going to watch a little video. And I want you to think as you watch it, what a teacher would need in this situation. Okay? So think about, he'll be acting in the role of a teacher, what a teacher would need. Cheating yourself. If there's 25% divided among the five of you, that's 14% apiece. Oh, no, listen, Pa. I, I wouldn't cheat you. You know I wouldn't. Now, look. Look here. I'll show you. Let me rub this out here. And now, 25 divided by five is five. You see, if the five won't win a two, will it? No. But five goes into 25. Five times, you see? Oh, you're wrong, Billy. Now, now, I'm pretty good mathematician. Now, five into 25. Five won't go into two. Uh, no. But five goes into five once. Oh, oh. Now, we didn't <laughs> use the two before, so we're playing down here. Now, five into 20 goes four times. There you are. Five into 25. No, look, Pa, now, let me prove it to you now by modification. Uh, five times five, five times five is 25. Well, I'm surprised you're learning. Huh? I'm surprised that you're learning. Now I'll show you. Five times 14 is 25. Five times four is 20. Five times one is five. <laughs> one thing is five. That's it. No, no, look, 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 you're wrong there because you know, I'll, I'll prove it to you. I'll, we'll put down four, five fourteens here. Fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. There, now. Now, I'll prove to you by addition. Now, five times four is twenty-four. Five times four is twenty-four. Five times five is twenty-four. Now, I'll prove to you by addition that, that five fourteens is not twenty-five. Four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. <laughs> like an extreme example is something that teachers encounter all the time, right? Is that the students, in this case his parents, are very convinced of their answer, which differs from the teacher's answer. So one of the questions is, what is it then that we need to develop in teachers that they not only know their subject matter, because he's quite sure that five times five is 25, and he can prove it through addition, multiplication, division, you know, he can prove it to them, but they're not buying it. So one of the things that teachers need, and I think excellence in teaching requires, is for teachers to be connoisseurs of error. They actually know, have to know every single way you could get the wrong answer and be 
be able to address that. Um, this is what I think about as intellectual empathy. Um, how do we, in developing teachers, help them understand that error is a source of learning for the teachers as well as for the students? And then how to follow the thinking of that individual um, so that they can help them address where the mistakes are. In this particular, we, I know we have a lot of math teachers in the room, what, what was one of the errors that the parents were making? What's the thing that you would address in this particular example that might help the parents figure out why five times, five percent, five percent is not, 25 percent is not, five, 25 percent divided by five is not 14. <laughs> Value. You notice the place value kept shifting every which way. So place value. So good teachers have to see that in a minute and see how you can address that. So again, one of the attributes is not just knowing the subject matter, but knowing how students might think about that subject matter. The other piece of it, and that I've spent a lot more time recently thinking about, has less to do with teacher's knowledge and more to do with their skills. So part of what, in that example, the teacher would need to do is to be able to elicit the student's thinking, which actually he did a little bit because you saw a lot of evidence of how they were addressing those problems. You need to be able to pro provide clear, compelling instructional explanations, in this case, about the place value. You need to create opportunities for them to learn to do that themselves, and you need to provide feedback that targets both what somebody's doing well, but also what they could do next. What do they understand? What's that next step? And it's this beginning to define the attributes of excellence in teaching and to begin to name them and define them that has, I think, defined the work of, the, of my own work of the last, let's say, eight years or so, and also defined part of the work of the center to support excellence in teaching. Um, I'll just let you read this quote, but it, it is part of the issue that we're trying to address. In so many ways in teaching, we lack that common language for describing the work of teaching, of being able to parse teaching into its various components and to be able to share that common framework for defining the work. And without being able to define the nature of the work, it's very hard to improve. So part of this effort to define core practices is, again, to begin to identify the components of this very complex practice. We're fond of saying in teacher education that teaching is complex, teaching is complex, teaching is complex. Saying teaching is complex doesn't help anybody else learn the practice. So part of, in essence, the search for core practice is to begin to figure out what are the building blocks? What are those components of excellence in teaching that we can define and then help others learn? So the way we've begun to define core practices are those practices that are central to the daily work of teaching. They're central to supporting student learning because that's what teaching is, the goal of teaching. They're also fundamental for developing more complex practices. So some of you who have get, seen me give this talk, I've seen, heard the cooking analogy, which is that you learn to be egg whites, not just so you can learn to be egg whites, but you, so you can make things like soufflés or meringues. If you can't be egg whites, you will never make a good souffle, right? Um, so at some point, that is one of those foundational skills that is essential for going further. So again, in teaching, what are those that we want people to really have well developed when they enter the classroom, in part so they can keep improving? And that there are practices that underlie many different approaches. They're not tied to a single curriculum. Because again, if the work of teacher education is to prepare people for each and every curriculum, and each <coughs> curriculum to require a different set of practices, we would be in in a country that is as decentralized as ours 
and where every local school district, in essence, defines its own curriculum. So the, the search for these core classes is probably the search for developing that common framework that Lori said we lacked, a common language, and a common understanding of what those practices might be. Other pra professions have managed to do this. So this is from the nursing intervention classification on the left, where they had a whole set of domains of the work of nursing. And when, you know, some of them, like electrolyte management or airway management, you might recognize and understand, they also had things like invoking humor or providing spiritual support. Because they said, if you don't name it as part of your work, you won't teach it, you'll forget to develop it, and it will be undervalued. So how do we, again, make visible all the components of a practice so that we can teach them develop them, and value them. In clinical psychology, I traveled across a number of programs of clinical psychology, and everyone agreed that one of those core practices, absolutely foundational, was developing therapeutic relationships with clients. Um, because what they know, actually, from research, is that if you're able to develop that therapeutic relationship, many different approaches to uh, psychotherapy will work, and if you can't, nothing works. It's foundational, it's core. If you don't get that one, you're not going to go back in the profession. Um, expressing empathy, responding to resistance. Uh, these should sound a little bit familiar to those of you who teach. So in other professions, we've managed to, in some ways, codify the work of teaching and develop, again, sort of classifications of the practice. We're still in the early stages in many ways, of doing that in teaching. Um, and one of the questions that I'm pondering is why has it been so hard in teaching to, again, come up with that framework um, that across the profession we could agree on? So some examples of core practices that a number of us across the country <coughs> have begun to name are things like eliciting student thinking, providing instructional explanations, facilitating productive classroom discourse, teaching clear routines for managing transitions, communicating with parents. Anybody want to argue with any of these? Any of you think are not critical to teaching? So a fair amount of agreement on these. Um, one thing you'll probably notice is these are pretty generic, right? It doesn't say for the teaching of math or the teaching of English. It actually is a general kind of list. There are other core practices, and Brad Fogo has helped to begin to define these in history, that are much more subject specific. Things like launching a math uh, problem to, to provoke mathematical thinking. I never did that as an English teacher, actually. Um, history selecting and adapting <coughs> primary source documents, English modeling metacognitive strategies, for um, science identifying a testable question for inquiry. So there are some of these practices that may be very specific to the subject matter that we're teaching. As we begin to build this framework or this classification system, one of the questions that I'm pondering is how generalizable are these features of excellence in teaching? Does excellent teaching look the same in all subject areas, at any grade level, for all students, or in all school contexts. Before you turn and talk, I just want to, again, tell you some things that have really provoked my thinking about this. The first was as a parent. So my son had, I really still think, one of the best elementary school teachers any of my kids ever had in Seattle. Her name was Sarah Allsdorf. He had her in a split second and third grade. And when she went on to teach third grade the following year, I asked if Ben could continue with her because she was such a fabulous teacher. I just thought, you know, why not get two years with her instead of one? Um, and when my daughter got uh, Mrs. Allsdorf as her third grade teacher a few years later, I just thought I'd won the lottery. I thought, oh my God, this is, you know, we are getting the best teacher. This is so exciting. And then I found out that a parent who won the lottery 
who had the winning ticket, withdrew her son uh, from that class and put him in another <coughs> class, who I had also observed and thought was not at all as, as strong a teacher as Mrs. Foster. How can that be? How can who I think is really the, you know, really the best teacher in school have a parent who says, no, this isn't the teacher for my child. And when I talk to the parent later, she goes, oh, it's just, you know, it's, I just want my child to have fun. And she just is too challenging. She's, she's always kind of pushing the kids to the next thing. And, you know, it's just, I don't want, I want them to just have fun. A second puzzle was when I taught a freshman seminar at the University of Washington on teaching. And uh, you know, they were people who were thinking about becoming elementary school teachers. And I had them think about the question that you thought about already. Was, who are the teachers that most influenced you? Who are the, the teachers that you probably are going to, in some ways, imitate because they are so powerful on your own experience and trajectory? So one, there were, there were two um, young women who were both in the same town, both in this freshman seminar. And one of them went on with great enthusiasm and passion her high school uh, social studies teacher who she thought was fabulous. And she went on and on about how he had challenged her and how you know, he made her love history and never loved history before. And as she keeps going on, the other, you know, I suddenly noticed that the other young woman is looking at her with growing horror and then finally stops her. Are you talking about Mr. X? And she says, yes. He was my worst teacher. <laughs> I hated him. That was the worst class I took. So two young women, both wanting to be teachers, and who had absolutely polar opposite opinions of this particular teacher. Finally, in the work that we had done around Plato, which was an effort to both sort of identify the features of excellence in teaching of English, um, and then to measure those things, um, we did a study in New York City, and we found we had them, we had teachers who were both had the most impact on student achievement and not as much impact on student achievement in the same schools. And one of the things that we found in that study was that the school context mattered. The teachers who were teaching in the less functional schools with, that had a lower grade by the New York City Department of Education, that had a lot more challenges in terms of school climate, in terms of administrative support. The teachers in that highest quartile who had a lot of impact on student achievement had the highest scores on Plato. They, the difference between the high value added and the lower value added teacher test score was much greater than in the higher functioning school, where they, they sort of looked similar, much less different. So there was something about that school context that to be a good teacher in that school, you were doing really good things according to It really matters. So take a minute again and talk to your table about this question. Like, to what extent does excellent teaching look the same? And how might we think about, if we were trying to codify it, how we would parse it by some of these features? OK, people want to share? <laughs> People want to share some of what they were talking about at their tables. Um, I know I heard a lot of discussion about school context, for example. Some of the things that people were talking about. Yes, we love to them here. Um, <laughs> we were talking about, so take your example um, where you mentioned eliciting student thinking as a core practice, and we were suggesting that um, you would, that would be a core practice of an excellent teacher, but the way in which you would enact it would change based on the context in which you're teaching. And you would privilege certain core practices over others and order them in different ways based on who you're teaching. So mm -hmm. like Pamela was talking about, I know this wasn't one of the four bullets you put up there, but um, building relationships with kids, just similar to the clinical psychologist yeah. needing to and develop their therapeutic relationships. Yeah. She spends a lot of time building relationships at the start of the school year based on her school's context. One would argue all teachers need to do that, but you may do it, have to do it at different um, levels of degree based on your on the kids you're teaching and what their context is outside of school and that kind of thing. So we're saying the flexibility of the context affects the way you privilege the core practices. Other thoughts? Did 
think we sort of came down about the same thing is that there might be core practices, but they're going to be they're going to look differently depending upon the individual and the circumstances. So. Okay. So again, this notion, again, it's a very important question for teacher education, right? Because to a certain extent, in, in teacher education, you want to focus on those things that are foundational and that are going to be useful across as context if you're preparing teachers for lots of different contexts. If you're working in a program that's preparing teachers for a very specific context, then you can focus in on those. But being clear, again, about what are those practices that are most important for that particular subject, grade level, students, or context, helps then in developing those practices by allowing you to really target and focus on those. So again, this is one of the questions that I think is still an open question. We went through a long period where teaching was described very generically, and most of the emphasis was on generic teaching practices. We swung, uh, in part, thanks to Lee Shulman, to a much more subject-specific view of teaching, where each subject matter would have its own framework for thinking about what excellence in teaching looked like. And I think we're swinging back now. We're in a particular moment where people are beginning to think, but wait a minute. If we're preparing elementary school teachers, aren't there some things that might be common across those subject areas? How do we think again about what those might be and then how to really develop those um, in our novices? Which leads me really to the, the heart of the talk, which is how do we develop excellence in teaching? And if my life has been spent pondering, my work has been spent developing, both studying and developing excellence in teaching. Um, as some of you know the framework that I've developed for the thinking about the teaching of practice which has to do, again, with the notion of creating opportunities for novices to see high quality examples of teaching, that you can't do something that you haven't seen and haven't had a chance to unpack and understand. Some of that has to do with, again, that um, unpacking a very complex practice into those component parts. Another is the opportunity for deliberate practice. And I'm gonna focus my, my thinking there because I believe with the tool of Gawande that much of teaching, there are some of those qualities of teachers that we talked about earlier that you might wanna select for, but we are never going to select our way into excellence when we think about the number of teachers we need to prepare for this country, right? Selection is important, but it's not sufficient <laughs> when you're preparing a workforce of over three million people. You can't rely on selection, so you've got to think about how do you develop that skill. And again, part of the focus on core practices is the belief that teaching is a learnable occupation. You can learn these practices, you can get better on them. So the opportunity to practice in safe settings is going to be a key component of that. And finally, you need to have feedback on your practice in order to improve. So um, practice is a word I use in many, many contexts, in many ways. And I just wanted to feature two different versions of this. Um, any of you who've played a musical instrument know the first definition of practice, right? So you get better at something by that repeated exercise or activity or skill. This is how we get better in sports, how we get better in music, how we get better in language, is having that kind of continued practice. Um, the notion of deliberate practice comes from the work on expertise development. And it's a different kind of practice that is very targeted. Um, it, it doesn't just mean constant repetition, so if you heard me practice piano, you would hear me make the same mistakes over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, I can still play the same sonatina I played when I was 16, and I still make the very same mistakes um, because I never stop and really focus on those parts when I'm making the mistakes. I just play through the sonatina, and okay, I make the same mistakes I made when I was 16. What this work on expertise found is that experts actually practice very differently from even very talented amateurs. They didn't keep playing through the whole piece if they were musicians. They actually focused on the hardest parts. They said, this is the section that's giving me trouble, so I'm 
just going to focus on that section over and over and over until I get better at that. So that kind of deliberately targeting of the most challenging aspect of the practice is what's meant by deliberate practice. And it's worth thinking a little bit about how few opportunities teachers have to engage in that kind of deliberate practice that leads you to expertise. Because we know that experience in teaching doesn't necessarily lead to expertise. You can teach for many, many years and still not have reached that highest level, in part, I think, because we have so few opportunities to pause, step back, and really engage in this kind of de both deliberate practice, reflection on that practice, and getting feedback on that practice. So one of the things that the new effort in practice-based teacher education has been thinking about is how do we create within teacher education those opportunities for teachers to practice something and get in the moment feedback, and then Try it again, right? So here, this notion, I'm going to show you an example of a rehearsal. Um, rehearsal would be one of those um, opportunities where somebody has a chance first to rehearse, maybe an instructional explanation, maybe the modeling around of a cognitive process. And then, again, get some feedback and try it again. Those of you in Hala actually have experienced it. Those of you who are in STEP have been experiencing some of this. Um, because, again, Try new things in a classroom is very risky. And teachers sometimes will try complex instruction, they'll try grouping, they'll try metacognitive modeling. And when you fail in front of a group of adolescents, as I know some of us in this room have, it doesn't encourage you necessarily to try again. You may just end up retreating from that practice. So thinking about ways to create a safe for practicing some of the really complex components of teaching, I think is one of the challenges facing teacher education. This question. So I'm going to show you now a video of a rehearsal, which is one of these approximations of practice. This is happening in a teacher education classroom and the student at the University of Washington. Um, the student is practicing an instructional activity called Coral Counting. Um, and the students in the, in the room are other uh, prospective teachers. So they're all other elementary teachers. And you'll hear the voice of the teacher educator um, in this as well. The important part of this particular opportunity is that the, the novice teacher is going to actually lead this very activity in an elementary school classroom the next day. Okay, so this, this is a real reversal in that she's actually going to be doing it the next day. So as you watch it, I want you to be thinking about what are the features of this? What is somebody learning from doing this? And what's the rest of the class learning as they watch her? So 
really you have two in the tens column and one in the hundreds column. So how are you feeling up there, Alina? <laughs> As Louis hey, was talking. So I don't need to repeat what he said. But I'm like, what did he say, right? I need to be able to repeat what he said and then throw that back out to the class so you can say, oh, well, what does anyone think about that? Or can anyone explain what he's saying? So you can right. You're in a position to yourself. Yeah. You're in the position all the time of trying to make sense of this person live on the spot <laughs> at the same time that you're trying to decide, do I repeat this? Do I understand what this person is saying? Does anybody else follow what this person is saying? Right? Something in my head, and he's asking me to explain that. Hopefully, he'll remember. Just out of curiosity, in that case, when he said you have uh, 12 and a 10, um, would you would you want to take time out to go over regrouping, flipping over to the hundreds place? I mean, how would you even address that? Or would you just kind of, it would totally kill your momentum. So yeah. I would go off on a huge tangent right here. I'd make, huh, you said 12 minutes. You have 12 tens. That's the issue. Tens. Right, okay. exactly. So I'd say, huh, that's really interesting to me. What do you think 12 tens means? Okay, everybody follow that. Okay. So uh, this is an example, as I've said, of, in some ways, deliberate practice. Um, and one of the reasons I like showing these uh, rehearsals is it makes visible complexity of teaching, the challenge of teaching. She's trying both to elicit student ideas, she's trying to make sense of those student ideas, she's trying to write on the board as she's trying to track the student ideas, and then also make sense of how would I explain this? What should I do in this moment? So um, I want you again to turn to, your, uh, to the group and talk a little bit about, one, how is this an example of deliberate practice? What is the student teacher getting an opportunity to practice? And what might her peers who were watching her be learning from this um, opportunity?
part is where there's a mistake. And I would agree that it helps to highlight that each of the complex acts, but I think one of the fans' roots is the field of the Can we parse out some very uh, particular elements that we can It actually puts her in the role of the teacher. So she actually has to do the work of teaching in that moment, as opposed to talking about teaching. So in one of my efforts to try out these approximations, um, I, was, I had seen a, in a clinical psych class um, them teaching novice psychologists how to respond to resistance. And as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, what's more useful for teaching? You know, that, that there's nothing more normal than at some point somebody's going to say, no, I really don't want to write that. No, I really don't want to answer your question. No, I think I'll just put my head down. <laughs> um, and so I had the students talk about how would you respond to resistance. And they came up with a great list, really great ideas. And we wrote them all down. And then I said, OK, let's practice. And I gave them a scenario, um, borrowing them from clinical psych where they use these scenarios, and it set it up. And um, they began the role play, and I'm wandering around the classroom, and you know, to my horror, I see people yelling at the person, <laughs> um, engaging in an argument, which we had agreed was not an effective way to do this. All the things that we had talked about not to do. So the difference between talking about and actually doing was this big. And yeah, yeah. So again, giving them that experience before they have it with kids. So they have an opportunity, again, to pause and think, oh, what if they say 12 pence? What do I do, right? Mm -hmm. How do I respond to that? Okay, so again, giving them experience in a, in a more protected setting. Other things? Yeah. It's also a setting that is set up for that adult to be learning. Often, like when you're in the classroom, you slept four hours last night, you're worried about like, you know, what you're doing after school with your extracurricular, like the parent that just yelled at you. Like it's not, even if you came across that situation, you're not set up to actually learn from it the way you would be uh, what we saw. Okay, nice. So this is a, a, in some ways a designed environment for learning. That you really, you have both the teacher educator, somebody who's more skilled in the room. You have other um, novice teachers there that help you learn from that. So it gives you that space and time, which is critical for teachers. 
to really learn from this. Other things. What's everybody else learning watching? It, it might be clear what she's learning. Um, and that part of what you see is that it's hard to do what she's doing, and she's trying to coordinate these different things. What's everybody else learning? What are her peers learning? We're talking about the opportunity to be on the cutting edge of the receiving ends, of, you know, the potential of how it's interpreted by a student, um, rather than feeling like you know how you're saying it and how it would be. Good, so it puts you in that student role, so you have a chance to actually experience what that teaching is like. It gives you a sense of that. Yeah. Uh, it's working on that like, intellectual empathy, because in order to come up with questions that are going to challenge your peer, which of course you want to do to help her learn, uh, so you have to come up with questions that might be plausible errors, and so it's practicing like your own intellectual empathy for student problems so that you'll be able to think of those and anticipate them in the future. Yeah, so it's giving you again more experience with some of those predictable things that might come up in this activity and a chance to develop some, some understanding of that. Sure. Pam, I, I was actually wondering about the role of her peers and mm -hmm. was that explicitly told to them? Were they observers of the situation or were they actors in the situation? They were to act as students, students in the okay. yeah, students in the class. So they were participating in this choral counting activity, but it was really a dual role. They were also observing it as uh, teachers as well. So in some ways, again, part of, I would argue that this functions a little bit like a master class in music, if any of you have seen those, where um, a, an expert musician works with a whole group and then will work with an extended way with one individual. But the feedback that the person is giving that individual musician is actually visible and available to everybody else there. So you notice that that question about what would you say if somebody said 12 tenths? So this is somebody who hasn't actually had that experience yet but is learning about, oh, that could happen. And then what would I say? So it's again creating the opportunity not only for the person who's practicing, but for the others who are there to see, oh, that could come up. I have to think about what that would mean and to learn from the feedback they're getting. So these, the practice-based uh, teacher ed movement and this uh, core practice consortium mm -hmm. is really trying hard to think about what are these approximations of practice look like? What does rehearsal as a particular kind of pedagogy look like? What are the other kinds of approximations we can create to help novices have more of these experiences that allow them again to, and what she does is she then redoes it. So she gets to replay it and learn in immediately from that kind of feedback. So now I'm gonna to turn to the roles of school, uh, schools of education because now this is the latest thing that I'm pondering is what is the role of schools of education? in preparing and supporting excellence in teaching. And I wanted to start with this quote by Ken Zeichner, uh, which was part of his Division K um, president, Vice Presidential Address in 1999. I just want you to note the date. And he said, there is no more important responsibility for school, college, department, or faculty of education than to do the best job that it possibly can in preparing teachers to teach in our schools of our nation and to support the learning of teachers throughout their careers. If we are not prepared to take this responsibility more seriously and do all that we can to have the best possible teacher education programs, then we should let someone else do the job. Well, this was a remarkably prescient comment in 1999 because lots of other people have stepped up to do the job of teacher education, uh, many of them not based in universities. So um, in a talk I gave at Teachers College, I began to show the range of uh, both districts, uh, nonprofits, charter school management organizations that have jumped into what has always been the responsibility of schools of education, and that's the preparation of teachers. So I believe that Schools of education have an absolutely critical role 
to play in this space and that they really need to do, as Ken said, all they can do to have the highest quality teacher education programs, to actually be engaged in learning from those programs and constantly experimenting and trying to improve the preparation mm -hmm. of teachers. And that's really at the center in, in many ways of what a school of education should be doing. Um, a lot of my work that hasn't been directly on the teaching and teacher education has actually been on looking at the growing number of pathways into teaching and thinking a little bit about how do we reimagine teacher education? How do we make teacher, how do we make the case that first of all, there is something to learn about teaching? That entering the classroom with minimal pre preparation is doing our children a disservice. That children deserve teachers who walk into the classroom capable of doing a good job. They may not be experts yet, but they are competent beginners. They have mastered some of those foundational practices, so they're not necessarily learning those um, with children as the, as the in some ways, so I want to think a little bit about what it would mean to reimagine teacher education. And again, I think this is a conversation that universities right now are on the periphery. So I belonged to a group, um, a community of practice called Learning to Teach. And this group uh, began, the first meeting um, I was not at, because the first meeting of that Learning to Teach group didn't include a single university-based teacher educator. It was Teach for America, the new teacher project, Aspire Schools. Um, uh, I could run through a whole list of, of them, but there were no university-based teacher educators at the table because that group didn't think that university-based teacher educators had much to teach them. Um, the first two teacher educators that were invited to come from the university were Magdalene Lampert and me. And the group has now shifted dramatically, so it's about 50-50 university-based and non-university-based teacher educators. Part of what's uh, important is to make the claim, and that that claim has to be true, is that part of the role of research universities and professional schools within research universities is to produce research that's responsive to the needs of the profession. It's actually research that teachers and principals can use in order to improve the quality of teaching and learning. So part of what schools of education need to be doing, and in fact, that's one thing that became um, obvious in the group, is that there was a research literature on many of these things that the existing group didn't know, right? Because they had come out of a very different perspective. So there are things that university-based, research university-based, um, schools of education can contribute to that conversation, but if we don't lay claim to that conversation, we are going to be on the sidelines of this next, uh, this next decade in reimagining teacher education. So that's my plea, is to be a part of the conversation. People said, how can you be at that table with all of these different people who may argue against university-based teacher education? I said, if you're not at the table, then you're not influencing the conversation. You're not able to actually say, that's a problem that, that actually teacher educators have been wrestling with for a long time. And we know something about that. So we're not constantly reinventing the wheel. So let me just give a few, and then we'll open it up, a few kind of ideas around reimagining teacher education. The first is to prune programs. There are a lot of programs. Universities compete with themselves. They offer alternative and traditional programs. They offer undergraduate and graduate programs. Every university thinks it has to offer every subject matter because you know, those are taught in schools. I studied in New York City where there's a teacher ed program on every corner. It's a little bit like Starbucks. Um, and they all offer um, secondary math education for secondary math teachers. Guess what the average number of teachers in those programs was? Anybody want to guess? Four. Very close. Four people. Okay, it takes resources to run a math education program. So who is teaching in those programs? All of the, they're not enough good math educators to teach in all of those programs. So maybe we don't need to have a math education program in every university in New York City. 
maybe there's some programs that are going to be outstanding on that, and other places that are going to take a pass and say, that's not what we're going to do, because we don't have the resources to do it well. Because if you don't have the resources to do it well, better not to do it. Um, press towards practice. Uh, I talked a little bit about this notion of practice-based teacher education, which is, again, trying, it, and it's not, it, the definition of practice here is a very broad sociocultural one. Practice involves knowledge, identity, as well as skill. But if we don't, again, help novices develop their practice and put them out into the field as proficient in those practices, then we're not doing our job. We're not doing anybody a favor when we say, go and teach for social justice, and they don't know what that looks like in the classroom, or know how to enact those practices. They're passionate about social justice, but without that set of, of practices that go along with that, they, and my student, Matt, former student, Matt Monfeld, found they abandon the notion because they don't know how to do it. So press towards practice. Or you heard this one, produce knowledge that's responsive to the profession. Again, the problems of practice that we should be addressing in schools of education are the problems of the field. They're to help the field get better. That's the role of professional schools, and that's what they should be doing. And finally, and this is something um, the Core Practice Consortium is just thinking about, is how do we prepare outstanding teacher educators? Because if we know now that teachers matter, and teachers make a huge difference, when you bump up a level into higher education, it's the same thing. Right? Outstanding teacher educators matter. And how do we prepare them? Most people who walk into the job of a teacher educator are not prepared for it. One of the saddest days of my life was when I got a call from one of my former students at the University of Washington who had gone through the teacher education program there and had been teaching English. And she called me in mid-August and she said, Pam, do you have all your materials from our English methods class? You know, I keep binders. Anybody who knows me has seen the binders. I keep everything. As Sam knows, I keep everything. I said, well, yes, I, I, I do, in fact, have all the materials. This is what I was already here. I still have my University of Washington materials. She goes, could you send them to me? And I said, why? She says, I have to start teaching the English methods class here next week. And you know, the only thing I have to go on is what you did in our class. And I remember it being really good, so I just thought I'd get your materials. Now, that's a trap. That was trusted to her, um, that she wasn't supported in, in learning how to become an outstanding teacher educator. And the Travis students, I won't name the university, but let's just say it had high tuition, who are paying good money um, to be taught by people <coughs> who have some skill. So again, I think we haven't thought a lot about this last one. In STEP, I think we do a good job of preparing really outstanding teacher educators, in part by co-teaching with them and giving them opportunities to teach independently. But that is not the norm in this country. The norm is you call somebody up and say, we have an English methods course we need somebody to teach. Could you teach it? And that's, again, something I think we can change. So let me stop there.